Solomon, uh, the son of David, uh, is touted to be in 1 Kings uh, chapter 4, verse 29, uh, the wisest man who ever walked the planet. Uh, because when God asked him, what do you want? Uh, you know what he asked for, right? He asked for wisdom, and God gave him wisdom, but then God gave him everything else uh, as, as well. So um, he studied his father quite well, uh, his father being David the king, uh, and uh, being a wise man, uh, you don't get wise unless you analyze. And so he analyzed uh, his father. Uh, and when you read the book of Proverbs uh, that uh, Solomon wrote uh, many years later as an older man, uh, when his dad was long gone, uh, he says many great things that, that you, you got to understand that these probably came from watching his dad. And if you have a father, you've probably watched your father. I studied my father uh, many, many times on how, to, how he led hundreds of um, U.S. Customs agents. What's a leader like? So every son is looking at dad, and that was Solomon. So when you get to chapter 14, verse 34 of the book of Proverbs, uh, Solomon says this, righteousness exalts a nation. Flip side is, sin is a disgrace to any people. So he's a king, he's a leader, he's a politician. He's raised by a, uh, a father who was a military officer, uh, had been in battle many times, uh, was also uh, a king and a politician, and a godly man uh, at, at that. And uh, it, when Solomon looks at his dad's life, looks at his life, he comes up with a summation, which is uh, something, it's a truth that transcends time, does it not? So it's true back in the period of the kings, it's true in our day and age, that if a nation, by and large, pursues that which is righteous and holy by God's standard, not theirs, God then takes that nation and does what to it? He exalts it, he puts it up, because he, he, he blesses it, basically, is what it is. He makes them prosperous. Uh, the, the other side, the contrastive side is true as well. When a nation, and, he's, and, and Solomon is speaking here of political leaders, uh, abandon the word of God, the truths of, of nature that are built into the cosmos from God, uh, when they abandon morals and all the things that God has called us to observe, uh, there, it's a disgrace to that people. And this applies to any nation, not just the United States, Canada, pick the nation, Australia. Uh, it's, a, it's a time, uh, um, it's not bound by time. So he, I'm sure he got this from his father. Uh, and when you look at uh, uh, Solomon, who articulated that particular premise, um, I know that we, as I've thought about this passage uh, written by David, another D Davidic uh, song, uh, David is uh, writing again as a politician and as a king about his struggles as a politician and a king in a godless time. Uh, you have to step back and say before we dive into 144, uh, we don't live in a theocracy. Uh, I don't really know what we live in anymore. Uh, it is kind of convoluted. Uh, but I know we don't live in a theocracy where God is, all, you know, the head of all things and et cetera. Um, but I do know that what the scriptures teach here, even though we're not in, a, in the theocracy that David was, that Solomon was, what is said here by the Holy Spirit is true for any nation. That uh, just as a fish rots from the head down, so a nation can rot from the head down. So what's the solution? How does a nation become prosperous? You put God first. I mean, this could be a really short sermon. You're praying for such, but it's not gonna happen. Uh, now, David understood the premise that, uh, that his son's gonna articulate many years after the fact, uh, that you must pursue righteousness above all things. And so when you look at Psalm 144, which he wrote about, how does a nation, and how does a leader, how does, how does a person who leads people, how do you move your family? Because you, you, you could be a parent, you're a leader. But how do you uh, take your position as a Christian in said society, in a, in a family, uh, and move from a state of problems, issues, dysfunction to a great a place of great prosperity because what leader wouldn't want that if you're a father if you're a mother isn't that what you want for your children is that they would be prosperous that you would be prosperous and if you whatever you are as a leader whether you're a navy captain an admiral whatever you are this should be as a godly person what you want for the troops underneath you that that they would be prosperous that they would be blessed etc that is that's 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 david so David's gonna answer this question uh, that's, uh, that, that derives from this particular uh, psalm of how can you move from problems uh, that are brought against you as a godly person for living a godly life uh, to, a, to a point of prosperity and blessing. Uh, and so remember, he's a king. You might not be a king. He's a politician. You may not, or you may be a politician. But what he's going to say is applicable uh, to you as well as to me. So if you look at his context of that he lived in, uh, he, he managed the people that were tough to manage. Uh, because some of them loved God. 
couldn't wait to get to the temple to worship God. Uh, others uh, went to the temple, checked the box. It was just a ritual for them. They didn't really care. They went outside the temple gates and lived as wickedly as they wanted to. Other people, there's no way that they're going to darken the door of the temple. And so he had all kinds of people all over the map. But as you're going to read this psalm, he wanted one thing for them. He wanted his nation, his people, to be blessed of God. What do I want as a pastor? That my church would be blessed of God. That my family's in my church would be blessed of God, that my family would be blessed of God, that it, on and on it goes, that my county, my country, et cetera, would be blessed. Well, when you have so much opposition in said societies as David did, how do you get there? So he's gonna talk about that. Um, Ecclesiastes 12, and Michael and I were talking about that this morning before I came in here. Uh, we were talking about answering to God for what you do. You know you will answer to God, correct? Yeah, and the older I get, the more I think about this. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? When you're 25, you're going, I got plenty of time, roads stretched out before me. The older you get, what are you doing? Eh, time's getting short. Uh, so uh, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, and I am getting to Psalm 144, don't forget, I have not forgotten. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, what, is, what does uh, Solomon say at the end of his quest for what is the purpose of life? What's his conclusion to the entire book of Ecclesiastes? The conclusion is, when all has been heard is, what should you do with your life? Fear God. And what should happen naturally after that? <laughs> uh, well, if you fear him, you're gonna keep what he says. I remember Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And, and he says, because this applies to every person, uh, that's, 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 that's not all of it, he says. He says, that, let me give you some motivation, verse 14. Why should you obey the commandments as you fear God? For God will bring how many acts? Every act to judgment. Uh, everything which is hidden that you didn't let anybody see or know about, whether it is good or evil, all men will give an account. Now, if you want to know how that plays out, well, then attend Book of Revelation and we'll explain it to you. I'm just trying to help you. Uh, so what he's going to talk about, how moving from uh, problems to prosperity, uh, is applicable to the point where you're going to have to give account whether you did it or not. So how do you do that? So he's gonna give you three things here uh, of, that you should apply. So uh, number one, he says you should, in verses one and two, you should seek God's person. If you wanna move uh, your, your family, your nation to a point of prosperity before God, you must seek the person of God, not yourself. You seek God first above all things. So notice what he says. He says, this is a Psalm of David. Uh, and he says then, blessed be the Lord. Who is the Lord? Well, he tells you what he is. What is he? He's a what? He's a rock. He's whose rock? He's, he's my rock. He's, he's, it's personal. What does God do? Well, he trains uh, your fingers for battle. Uh, he says, my loving kindness. He's my loving kindness. He's my fortress. He's my stronghold. He's my deliverer. He's my shield in whom I take refuge, uh, who subdues my people that he manages as a leader under me. He helps me manage them. But he goes through all these metaphors to describe God. See, a great leader has great thoughts about God. A small leader has small thoughts about God. And so what does David say? He says, as I think about making my nation prosperous, I plan on focusing a lot on who God is. And so look at the metaphors of how he describes God. He says, uh, number one, God is my rock. He's my rock. Uh, the Hebrew word, if you were to translate it, is really the word for boulder. So this is, this is like massive. And when you think of a boulder, what words come to mind? You have no idea? Immovable. It's immovable, it's massive. You're not picking it up. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it is huge, it's a, it's a boulder. And so he says, when I think about being in a problematic situation as a leader over a people who fight among themselves, we're surrounded by en enemies that fight us, people hate my political leadership, some people love me, all the things that he went through, he says, I am so glad that when I think about my life, God is my, not pebble, God is my boulder. Because that means he's not going anywhere. So the devil's going to come to you and tell you, you're all alone in this. It's over for you. And David's like, no, 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 no. No, you don't understand, devil. God is my boulder, which means he's always going to be there for me no matter what happens. Number two, he says, God is my fortress, verse two. Uh, a fortress. Um, so he's, he's going to tell you that even you know, when you live for, a, as we talked about last Sunday, if you live a godly life, you're going to face persecution because you're gonna kick up uh, the, the dust of the darkness around you and they're not gonna like it. No matter how nicely you present the truth of the word of God, they're going to then persecute you in some way uh, or form. And so David says, when that happens, God is my fortress. 
Because in Israel, if the shofar horns began to blow on the various hillsides, and you didn't live in the fortress proper, and the shofar horns are telling you, enemies coming, where are you supposed to go if you have a brain? Well, I'll just ride this one out. The enemy will probably be, you know, they'll be nice and merciful to me. Uh uh. No, there was no Geneva Convention. You better get to the city and get to the fortress. You didn't even get caught outside. So David says, God is my fortress, which means I can run to him for protection. You know, so when I see the enemy coming after me for living a godly life as a politician, as a king, as a leader, as a captain, whatever you are, and there's opposition, you're not alone. That you can say, no, I'm going to make it through this because I can run to God and hide in him because he will be the fortress that will protect me. He says he's also my high tower. So he's like, he's like a fortress, but he's also a high tower. Um, you see this when you go to Israel. We'll take you to the, uh, the Dead Sea and we'll show you Masada. Uh, this is a picture from Masada looking south. Uh, and you can see the remnants of the Herodian um, uh, palace uh, on, on the on the cliffs there. Uh, it, so this is this is an a, an amazing fortress uh, that we know eventually the Romans attacked it by uh, building a, a mound to run the battering rams up the ramp. Uh, took them several years to do it. So any metaphor breaks down. All right. So when I tell you God is like Masada, don't tell me yeah, but it was defeated. Just <laughs> go with the metaphor, okay? All right. Dick, I know you know Israel well, having been over at the embassy. It's, this works, right? Thank you. Praise God for you. Shalom. Um, so when you say God is like a high tower, that's like the first time you go to Masada and you're looking at it and you're thinking, tram or walk? I've never walked. What did you say, brother? You lived there. Yeah. Always take the tram. It's not God's will to walk up that thing. No. I had a Navy kick, kickboxer uh, with me in my first tour. Uh, there right after 9-11, uh, and we all took the tram up. He ran up. <laughs> Insane. I don't know what they teach you in the Navy, but it's like, take the tram, dude. Uh, he, he ran up. But, but you go up there, and you're like, wow, I, you get vertigo. You're looking out the windows, and it's thousands of feet down. I have walked down before. Uh, last, the, well, the only time I walked down after 9-11, I... Um, I had a video camera, I videotaped myself standing on the side of a cliff thousands of feet down. I basically told my wife, hey, it's me, it's Marty. This is amazing. If you don't ever see me again, <laughs> I, I was having an awesome time. You know, I didn't know if I was gonna like fall or, or whatever. And, um, it, but when you get up there, it's like, man, this is like God. He's up here where the eagles are. So no matter what the opposition is, you can stop and say, you know, God is my fortress. That no matter what happens, I can go up that snake path trail and get into the gate, close the gate, and, and God will help protect me. You ever run to him? See, arrogant people don't run to him because they don't think they need him. But a humble person says, no, no, he's reduced to me to where I know I need to run to him. Uh, he says he's also my shield. You would never want to be in a, a battle without a shield. It's just like you would never want to head into battle without a flak jacket, right? And maybe some metal plates inserted. Am I right? Yeah, to absorb enemy fire. Same thing. If you've got a shield, you can absorb arrows. So he says, God is my shield. So he knows that whatever the devil fires at me, well, he's going to be shooting at me as a godly man. But, but the, the, the shield, which is God, and when you read Ephesians 6, it's the word of God, is going to protect me. It's going to protect me. And so the devil's going to shoot all kinds of things at you. Like what kind of arrows would the devil shoot at you in a given week? You know who the devil is? Yeah. What kind of arrows does he shoot at you? Or have you thought about it? Financial arrows? You're not going to make it? What? Health. Yeah, your health? He can shoot at your, yeah, yeah, I know that one. Yeah, shoot at your health? Yeah, what else? He's only got two arrows? Discouragement? Disillusionment? I mean, just go down, fear? Just go down the list. He's shooting arrows at you all the time. Uh, and, and that's when you say, God, thank you for being my shield. Because if you want to move from a place of problems when you're walking with God and, and the devil starts shooting at you, you're not going to want to be on the battlefield without God as your shield. So uh, whatever you're experiencing, realize that God has absorbed much of what could have come your way because he's your shield. Now, David's battle were primarily physical and spiritual, right? Ours are not physical, as it were, but they're more spiritual. Ephesians chapter 6, uh, Paul says this about spiritual battle. He says, as a Christian, this is a command, you should put on the full armor of God. Why? Well, that you can stand firm against the schemes of who? The devil. The devil. He says, for our struggle, he says, as Christians, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, 
against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Uh, you know, first time I took an exeget exegetical class uh, in Greek in grad school, and we went through the whole book of Ephesians. I mean, all these words here are words that denote demonic rank, because they're, they're put together in rank like an army. So he, Paul says, you should have the, the armor of God on when you go out onto the battlefield of life, uh, because you face demonic activity in the unseen world that you can't see. And so you would never want to be without the armor of God on, and that's a whole other series in and of itself to study it. Uh, I just submit it to you that you're in a spiritual battle, uh, and God is your, he, he's your, he's your high tower, he's your fortress, he's all the, the shield to you, and all those types of things. Why? Because the, you're on the devil's terrain. This is his domain until God boots him out of here, uh, which we're studying in what book at 6.30? Yeah, Revelation at 6.30. Uh, so uh, you can read, uh, when I graduated from high school, my mom's sister, my Aunt Roberta, who passed away from uh, breast cancer at 52, godly woman, uh, my, my birthday present from my aunt were two books, Angels by um, Billy Graham, yeah, and it was a really good read before I went off to college, uh, and Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis, and I'm like, who is this? Who is C.S. Lewis? That book blew my mind. <laughs> The whole time I'm in college, I'm thinking, I see exactly what the devil's doing to me. Uh, and, and so it's that I'm in, I'm in a spiritual battle, all right? So who helps you in the spiritual battle? Well, God trains you. He teaches you how to deal with the spiritual battle. Well, how do I know that? Well, read, read 2 Corinthians 10. Paul talks about it. Uh, verse 3, what's he say? For we as Christians, we don't walk in the flesh. Well, how do we walk? Well, we don't war according to the flesh. He says, for our weapons, uh, well, they're of a different nature. He said, our warfare is not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Well, what kind of fortresses? Well, he says, we are destroying speculations, those kind of fortresses. Every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, we as Christians are taking, we're supposed to, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and we're ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. What's he, what did he just say there? Well, in the context, Paul is dealing with false apostles who are attacking him in the Corinthian church that he founded. I mean, power-hungry people inside the church, they're attacking him personally, ad hominem attacks, degrading him, uh, bringing false doctrine to the church. And so in chapter 10, Paul takes them on and says, I know exactly who you people are, and I know exactly what you're about, because Paul says, I take all the things, the arrows that you shoot at me, and I take all of those ideologies that you drag into the church, uh, and I bring them before Christ. And I ask Christ, truth or error? And if it's error, then we expose it as error. And if it's truth, then we, ex we, we extol the truth. See, this is spiritual warfare. This is whatever I hear when I'm in high school as a student, whether I'm listening to a university professor, or I'm watching a YouTube video on a series of whatever, whatever I'm listening to, I am then taking this before God and going, truth or error? Help me to understand the difference. Because it comes down, uh, when you look at, at dealing with those types of things, as God is your fortress, your high tower, your shield, etc., on the field of battle, you must understand that you must go to him to say, help me to evaluate these things, because the devil's crafty. So evaluate what kind of stuff? Well, uh, is critical race theory a friend or a foe of the church? It's a foe, but it's, it's dressed up as a friend. Um, how about is equality and equity part of great biblical theology. Sounds good, but it's not when you dig into it. Um, are there just two sexes and two genders, or are there multiple genders because we divorce genders from sexuality? Well, according to the scripture, there's two sexes and two genders, but my culture is saying, oh no, there's a hundred genders. Huh? So, but how am I supposed to think about, this? see what I mean? All of a sudden I've gone from, oh, now I understand what the battle is, it's the ideas. See, the devil attacks you with ideas. You then take the ideas and go, is that from God? And if that's not from God, then we expose that, and then we teach that which is truth. Uh, how do you move to a, a point of great prosperity? You live like that. Uh, where you take the things that you encounter and say, God, help me to think through these things. Uh, George Washington, a great leader. Uh, and his uh, first inaugural address, April the 30th, uh, 1789, he said this. He said, the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right, which heaven itself uh, has ordained. What did he just say in an English? Because they tend to write a little bit more interesting kind of English. If you abandon truth of logic and morals, etc., the word of God, God help your nation. 
uh, now I know George Washington had many issues. They were all, all men with clay feet, but he got one thing right. He feared God, uh, and I've read much about him uh, fearing God, and then God blessed him. Number two, that's just point one. Point two, I'm moving quickly. 30 minutes is nothing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, seek, seek God's provision, verses three to 11. This is the heart of the passage. You seek God's provision. So listen to what David says here in verse three. And maybe you have felt like this. O Lord, what is man that thou dost take knowledge of him or the son of man that thou dost think of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. He's here, he's gone. He said, David's saying, I'm the king, I'm the leader, but I feel like a nobody. Like in the major order of the cosmos, who am I that you are concerned about me? You ever felt like a nobody? See, this, this, is, this is a great leader. I, I had, I've, done many, um, I've done many promotions uh, at the Pentagon for people making rank. And I, saw, I know the Hall of Heroes well. Uh, and um, so uh, I was there one time with one of our men uh, who was, uh, make, he was moving from Army Colonel to uh, General. Uh, and so I, you know, we were going through the order of service and everything, and he came over to me as all these generals are filing in to sit on the front row, and he leaned over to me and he said, I'm the last person that should make this rank. <laughs> that's what he told me. You know what I told him? I go, you're, that's exactly why you're making this rank. He goes, what are you talking about? I go, because you're a humble man. You're a godly man. You're not a man full of hubris in yourself. You are a humble man. He goes, yeah, but I struggled all through West Point. That's okay. God sees you as a man of God. He's elevating you, see? And so when you feel humble, this, this, uh, that's a great leader. And, it, and you can understand this in the world in which you live. It's the really cocky, strutting peacock kind of people that are problematic to work for, correct? It's no one here. <laughs> um, so he says, look, God, why, uh, why would you even think about me? Why? Why would God think about you? You're the crown of his creation, He's made you in his image. He has great love for you as a child of God. That's why. So then what's he do? David then calls, calls for backup. I understand this as a former uh, police chaplain of 1,300 officers in California. I, get, I understand backup, don't you? Here's what he says. Verse five, God, could you uh, bow the heavens, O Lord, and come down? Haven't you ever prayed this in your life? God, come now. He says, uh, touch the mountains that they may smoke, flash forth lightning and scatter them, send out thine arrows and confuse them, stretch forth thy hand from on high, rescue me and deliver me out of the great waters, out of the hand of the aliens. Uh, aliens, uh, this, is, this is a word for someone that's not from your country. That's what the Hebrew word means. Whose mouth speak deceit, they lie, and whose right hand is, uh, it's all about falsehood. He says, as opposed to them, he says, I'm gonna sing a new song. Uh, to thee, O God, upon a harp of ten strings, I'll sing praises to thee, uh, who does give salvation to kings, who does rescue David, his servant, from the evil sword. But now in this situation, God, rescue me, deliver me out of the hands of aliens, whose mouth, he's going to now tell you twice what they do, they speak deceit, they lie. He says, whose right hand is, a, it's a right hand of falsehood. He says, I am surrounded by people that all they do is lie. The first time I went to go shop for a used car. <laughs> Why are you lying? I didn't say anything funny. Uh, I went to a friend of mine who was in banking, uh, and I went to him and said, okay, I need to go get a used car. I have this much money. How am I supposed to approach the sales guy? He goes, simple. If their mouth is moving, they're lying to you. <laughs> That's what he told me. He's on my elder board. I'm like, whoa, I, I was a boat salesman. I didn't lie. I told the truth. But yeah, it's, you know, it's hard to live in an environment where everybody's lying, right? Like if it's your family, no one tells the truth. At your office, no one, everyone lies to cover their tracks, etc. I mean, he says, this is the world that I live in. Is everybody is lying. Uh, so he says, God, I need backup. He says, could you like part the heavens and in your dimension come down? Haven't you ever thought these things? God, what are you waiting for? Come now. That, I mean, that's what he's calling for. One of my friends as a police officer in California uh, encountered a very large individual on, an, on a call one night. And he got there, uh, and he said the individual that was unruly was about six, seven, about 400 pounds. <laughs> yeah, and my friend, uh, Noe, Noe Gonzalez is his name. Uh, he's probably 5'11", uh, uh, about 165 pounds. And he said, I knew when I tased him and he just smiled at me, <laughs> I was in deep trouble. <laughs> yeah. 
You know, so he's like, I was like, what did you do? He said, I called for backup. <laughs> backup. And I'm like, I'm thinking, I mean, isn't this your life? You're being opposed. Things are bad. What should you do? Call for backup. Who's your backup? Don't call me. <laughs> I mean, you can, but call God first. Call God first. Why? Because when you live in a culture that is, uh, that is enmeshed in lies, how, do, how can you think your way through all the lies? There's so many of them. And they're so complex. Uh, when a nation does, gets to the point where there lies is the order of the day and truth has been thrown out the window, the, the nation is well nigh to destruction. Isaiah chapter 59, notice what it says about the fall of the nation that's impending. Isaiah says, for our transgressions are multiplied before thee, our sins testify against us, for our transgressions are with us, we know our iniquities, transgressing and denying the Lord, turning away from our God, they weren't seeking him, speaking oppression and revolt, we look for every opportunity to riot, uh, uh, conceiving in and uttering from the heart lying words, and justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away, and what has happened? Well, truth stumbled in the street, and righteousness can't enter. So, so he says, yes, truth is lacking, and he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. Yeah, if you turn aside from evil in a, a culture that's built on lies, they attack you. He says, now the Lord saw this, and it was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice, because there cannot be justice if there's no truth. Unfortunately, we live in a culture where they call that which is falsity truth, and it's daily. And what does God say? Have great thoughts about me. And when you get so enmeshed in lies, whether it's in your family, in your culture, in your school, wherever it is, call back up. I'm the backup. And tell them, God, I don't know how to fix this. You're going to have to help me. I think these are great words for us uh, to call in back up. What did Jeremiah do when he faced the culture of lies as the nation began to implode? Because he's preaching the impending Babylonian invasion and all the other prophets are speaking, peace, this is going to be peace. What does he say in verse uh, 9 of chapter 27? He says, but as for you, uh, do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, your sorcerers, who speak to you saying, false messaging, quote, you're not going to serve the king of Babylon. For they prophesy, he says, a lie to you in order to remove you as far from your land, and I will drive you out and you will perish. What did Jeremiah do when he faced liars? He told the truth. He spoke the truth. What should we do in our culture as we face people who lie and deceive and call it truth? What should we do? Tell the truth and love, but tell the truth because God will help you when you speak the truth to help bless your nation because a nation cannot be blessed if there is no truth. If truth stumbles, then there's no just, justice. Last thing he says is most interesting. He says the third thing you should do to move from a place of problem to great prosperity before God is seek God's prosperity. Ask him, ask him. Notice what he says. He says, let our sons in their youth be up, be as, I love this because God loves gardening. <laughs> let our sons in their youth be as what? Grown up plants. And our, if you like architecture, you're gonna like the next line. Let our daughters be as what? Corner pillars fashioned as a palace. That's not all he says. Uh, Let our barns as a nation be full, furnishing every kind of produce. Our flocks bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields. Let our cattle bear without mishap and without loss. And listen to this one. I mean, you could apply this to Chicago, Portland, pick the city. Let there be no what? Outcry in our streets. Why? There's no crime. No one's mugging anybody. Could you imagine? No cars are getting jacked. I mean, why? Because the nation's righteous. You know you're not supposed to steal, so you don't steal, so there's no crime in the streets. He says, God, I'm going to ask you for something big and bold. I'm going to ask you, would you bless my nation? I'm going to seek you. I'm going to call you in for backup, but I'm going to be bold enough to ask you, I want our nation blessed so that after I pass from the scene, our sons are like productive plants that produce and bless all those generations. And our daughters are wonderful and beautiful and they're key strategic placements in a, in a temple as it were because our daughters are so important. See, what's our world trying to do? Destroy our sons and destroy our daughters. And what does he say? No, God, you bless them because I'm gonna serve you first. You in turn bless my children, bless all of our children and may our nation just be overrun with blessing. But we get to blessing by taxing everybody, correct? Is that what he said? Uh, no, 
No, you get to blessing, you seek God, right? You seek his person, first point. Number two, you do what? Were you here for the sermon? You, <laughs> you call for backup when it gets too complex. And number three, you flat out stand before God and say, God, I wanna live to see a blessing on my children, on my grandchildren, when I am long dead and gone, that my quest for truth and following hard after you has been like this medicinal balm over all of them. Might we have leaders like that? George Washington, I close you with his words, his final words to the Senate, to the House of Representatives as a Christian man and a leader. Listen carefully to what he said about blessing. These are his final words. The situation in which I now stand for the last time in the midst of the representatives of the people of the United States naturally calls, uh, recalls the period when the administration of the present form of government commenced. And I cannot omit the occasion to congratulate you and my country on the success, blessing, of this experiment, uh, nor to re uh, repeat any fervent uh, supplications to the supreme ruler of the universe and the sovereign arbiter of nations that his providential care may still be extended to the United States, that the virtue and happiness of the people may be preserved, and that the government which they have instituted for the protection of their liberties may be perpetual. What was he asking for as a Christian leader? God, would you take my nation with all of our problems, and would you bless it beyond me? Oh, for leaders like that. Oh, for leaders that would pray for their nation and, and, and that then leads to the blessing of the nation. And may you be those kinds of mothers, fathers, et cetera, that you pray for the blessing. And God looks down from heaven and says, you know what, I'm gonna answer that because he's a good God. Let's pray. God, thank you uh, for David's insights about his life, about struggles he faced, and about how to live a life that's prosperous before you. Uh, we pray for our nation that it might have these kind of leaders. And we pray that we might be these kinds of leaders where you have placed us that we would do these three things and live to see your blessing in a profound way. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you uh, greatly, uh, and uh, you have a great uh, rest of your morning.